Ryan, I can't hear you. And now we're on muted. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Let me turn the volume up a little bit. Say that one more time, Trevor. Can you all hear me? Yes. Trevor, we can hear you and we're ready to begin. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Brian, I appreciate the music um, on my end and the pictures. I do have some questions about all of those, um, but we'll <laughs> uh, I'd like to recognize some of our special guests this morning. Uh, Mr. Kim Minky, board chair of the Kentucky Workforce Investment Board, Alice Shear Birkenau, executive director of KWeb, and Debbie Dennison, KWeb executive administrative secretary. And also, as a housekeeping note, if you're like myself, and zoomed in remotely, please keep your camera on for the entirety of the meeting. Um, that'll help us when we um, vote and confirm everyone on any voting matters. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to John for his opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. It is, uh, it is awesome to be here in person. Uh, we, we didn't have quite as many board members who were able to come in person as we had hoped. I think maybe weather the flu and some other factors have, uh, have played a role in that, but we do have quorum. And uh, for those of you that are here in person, welcome. We're, we're really uh, pleased to see you. We have not done this, this, this type of meeting since February of 2020. And so to me, it was important to, to do this, to get back together. One of the things I've realized in my seat is that over the last couple of years, we've had a lot of turnover of board, mem of board members and not, there's not, a, not a lot of you know each other. And so I think that sometimes that uh, inhibits conversation in these board meetings. Um, and so one of the goals today was not only to get together, but to get you guys together to meet each other, uh, to, to get to know each other a little bit better. Um, I do want to welcome our guests from Frankfurt uh, this morning. We're very honored to have you. Um, every December, this meeting every December is a show and tell. And so Alice here is the new executive director of the KWIB, and he had reached out to say, hey, when I'd like to come down at some point. And I said, well, why don't you come down for our December board meeting? Because we're going to do a big show and tell. Um, and so that's been a, you know, that was, we were able to work that out. So I appreciate you guys being here. Um, all right. So as we get started, uh, I just, I want to set the tone and the context for today's board meeting. Um, as always, we're going to follow the format of our agenda, which is we knock out our business up front, updates and business items up front. And then we transition to a strategic goal section. Um, and forgive me if I'm a broken record, but you know we, our our board has a, a strategic plan, and in that plan we have four strategic goals, and we don't write that plan and put it on a shelf. We we make that thing a living document, and so every board meeting we come back and report to you on how well we're progressing towards our strategic goals, and so we'll we'll do that. And um, and then what I've incorporated the last couple of board meetings is a, a wrap up section, um, as you know. Workforce participation has been a huge regional issue that we've been trying to tackle. And so we're gonna devote a few minutes at the end to talk about, you know, provide some updates on how we're trying to tackle uh, workforce participation in the South Central Workforce Development Area. Um, okay, so um, normally in this December board meeting, we, we, we hit you with a lot of data. It's a combination of a lot of data and then some personal stories. This time what we've opted to do is pull that some of that data back out, put it into a three page report, which you should have in your packet. Um, and so that that report kind of summarizes some data points from calendar year uh, 2022. If you have any questions today in this meeting, after the meeting, whenever, you know, our staff, we're here to we're here to, uh, to you know, answer those questions. We're happy to to go over that data with you. So this will be less data intensive than maybe in past December board meetings. Uh, last thing, I'll, I'll just kind of, the, the, the parting thought that I will share is this. Um, um, as we prepared for today, I, I sat back and I tried to reflect, okay, what, what did we do in 2022? What, what did it really look like? And I really boiled it down to three things. And those three things will be, you'll see them kind of interwoven into the presentation today. Um, 
But one, first thing I, when I think about 2022, we, as an organization, we, we grew into a leadership role in the region. And we'll, we'll highlight how we did that over, the, over this past year. Uh, the second is we made some really uh, dramatic improvements in our delivery of services to our customers. Um, and so you're gonna hear about that today. And then the third thing is that, um, is that um, we made significant strides in diversification of funding. You hear me talk all every board meeting about funding and the need to diversify, to stabilize uh, our organization. So we made some pretty, we made some, until we put this together, I didn't realize we did, we did really well uh, in, in how we've diversified funding this past year. Um, so anyway, that's it. So um, that's kind of the, the, the that's what today is going to look like. And so we'll get started. I, again, I'm really happy to have everybody here. And I will turn it back over to uh, our board. OK, our first order of business is to approve the October 13 uh, board, minute, uh, board minutes. Everyone should have received and had time to review the minutes already. Um, do we have any comments or questions regarding the minutes? And if not, do I have a motion to approve? Robin will move that they be approved. Thank you, Robin. A second? Bob will second. Thank you, Bob. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. So move on to the next item agenda, um, the executive committee updates from November 10th and, no and December 1st. Uh, we've recently had two executive committee meetings and we covered three item agendas on November 10th. The first agenda item was to review and approve the executive committee and board meeting schedule for 2023. Um, there's a copy of that in your packet today. And then um, next, John updated the committee. The new workforce participation lead position had been filled by Joshua Zaychek and that the new employee evaluation formats were complete and evaluate, evaluation timeline has been established. So we appreciate their work on both of those things. The final agenda item was a request to compensate staff for professional services rendered while performing work for EmployWord. And that motion was approved. Um, the executive team uh, reconvened on December 1st and there were four uh, agenda items covered on that date. First, John recommended uh, changes to our national located national dislocated worker tornado policy uh, for it had to be aligned with the recent Department of Labor and state policy changes and that motion was approved. Next, John presented the executive committee the final budget numbers for the period of July 1, 2022 to June 30th of 2023. And the analysis of the budget is that the WIOA allocation is not keeping pace with inflation of rising operational cost. Um, so the staff is very cognizant of this concern and is proactively reducing costs where they can and looking for additional grants and other external revenue to stabilize operations. The third agenda item was a request for $12,000 to be allocated towards staff pay raises. This would represent a 3% organizational increase in salary. And um, after much discussion, the executive committee approved the motion to allocate $12,000 toward pay raises and recommend to the full board to consider awarding two paid flex days to employees in 2023. And um, that will be presented um, to you momentarily for consideration. And the final um, executive committee agenda item for December 1st was a plan and timeline for completing John's evaluation um, using the new employee evaluation format. And the committee received his evaluation form and a copy of the performance goals established last spring. So each committee member will complete their evaluation of John no later than December 22nd um, using an online format. So I have sent those out to our committee members and um, we have till the 22nd to complete them. And that will give me plenty of time to compile all the feedback into a single evaluation form 
and we will use um, all that info. And um, on January 12th, 2023, the executive, executive committee will finalize his evaluation. And um, that's all I have for executive um, committee meetings. And we'll move on to the next item agenda, which is the approval of flex time for the workforce development employees. So John, do you wanna add anything to this? Any more explanation? Um, <clears throat> Sure. I'll, I'll just, again, as, as mentioned, you know, in the executive committee meeting, the conversation was, uh, you know, a 3% pay raise um, would be, um, that's the maximum we can offer in uh, over the last year. And so we had a pretty hearty discussion about adding, you know, offering up two additional flex days. Um, and uh, the board member or the executive committee thought that was a good idea that, but that we needed to bring it to you. And as we concluded that conversation, uh, we realized that to bring it to you today for a vote, we needed to articulate what those flex days, you know, put some definition around the flex days. And so, um, so I worked with Regina on this definition, but, you know, so the request today would be um, a one-time award of two paid flexible days off for employees to use at their discretion with advance approval by supervisors with some stipulations. Uh, first, this is for 2023 only. Um, it won't carry over into 2024. Uh, these flexible days will be available starting January 1st. Um, unused days will not be paid out uh, if somebody leaves the organization prior to uh, the end of the year. Um, and this will be for the employees who are employed by the board as of January 1st. So anybody new that comes on mid-year, this isn't going to apply to them. Um, this is, this is you know, just a small token of compensation or, or appreciation to our employees that are, um, you know, that are with us starting January 1st. Are there any questions about this, um, this recommendation? Okay. Um, hey, John, I, I got a question. Uh, yes, I, I see this recommendation, but I'm just wondering, uh, do the employees, uh, are they able to do remote work? Uh, Is there any remote work going on? Beverly, we actually have a remote work policy. And so uh, we established that uh, a little over a year ago. So employees that need to work remotely, we have a policy that governs, you know, how they request that. And um, that's, we've really, it's been an effective policy. We have not had any issues with uh, remote work. So is that uh, post-COVID? Yes. Um, yeah, this, this, uh, this policy went into effect about a year and a half ago. So, you know, once we got well into COVID, we were all working remotely anyway at the outset of COVID. And then mm -hmm. as we started to come back, I felt it was important to it that we have a policy that just governed remote work and what that needed to look like. Um, so, um, so, so by and large, we work in, in person, but if somebody needs to work remotely, they, there's just a, they have, there's a process in place to let us know. And it's, it's not really been an issue. Fortunately, we're the type of organization that can, can facilitate remote work opportunity. So currently is uh, the remote work uh, sort of like flex time that you are proposing? No, it's not. I mean, they're working remotely. The flex time is literally just, they're just two free days off. Uh, but they're not accruing like normal PTO days. So okay. remote, remote work, the, 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 staff, the staff member is working. They're just doing so remotely. A flex day is, a day, is essentially a day off. Okay. I mean, of course, we look at it differently in the world I'm in with flex and remote. So, okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any, any other questions? Okay, if we don't have any other questions, do you have a motion to approve? I make that motion to approve. Thank you, Beverly. Is there a second? I'll second that, this is Chris. Thank you, Chris. All in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? All right, motion carries. I will thank Chris Boggs, I see him on the call. He was the one that suggested that being more um, creative with how to, to give employees a um, little bit better benefits, especially um, when the funding for, you know, 
raises and things aren't the same. So thank you, Chris, for doing that. Um, we'll move on to agenda item number six, unemployment insurance changes. Yeah, Mike, Mike, Mike. All right, I'm Mike Carter, I'm the Regional Program Manager for the Career Development Office uh, for South Central and Cumberland. So we've had some changes to the state unemployment laws. Uh, we're going to touch on briefly. Are we working? Okay. We're going to touch on briefly. Um, we just had, uh, our, we're just informed of how we're going to implement some of these changes last week and uh, was asked to present this to you here. Uh, one of the things that's not changing is the weekly benefit amount for unemployment. The, the formula for uh, calculating the weekly benefit amount is, remains the same. It's 1.1923% uh, of your total base period wages uh, for a minimum weekly benefit amount of $39 and a maximum amount of $626. Uh, just for comparison's sake, right now in this area, we're averaging about a $350 a week benefit amount for those who are applying for unemployment. Um, the reason I bring that up is I hear quite often in these meetings that people are not working because they're getting unemployment benefits, like they're getting a lot of money from this. $350 a week uh, works out to be about they were making $30,000 a year before they were separated. And then they still have to qualify to be eligible for those unemployment benefits based on the reasons for their separation. So it's not like people are just quitting to go get unemployment benefits. Uh, the, what is changing is the number of weeks those benefits are available. Currently, we're at 26 weeks, which has been that way for years and years. Uh, now it's uh, changing to where it's going to be a sliding scale. Currently, we're at less than uh, four and a half percent. Uh, unemployment rate. So when the new law takes effect, uh, recipients are going to be entitled to 12 weeks worth of benefits. Uh, like I said, it's a sliding scale. So when unemployment rate goes up above 10%, it'll be 24 weeks of unemployment benefits. And it slides back and forth based on the, the rate, the unemployment rate six months prior to January 1st and July 1st. So it, it's cal recalculated twice a year. What that means is on, after anybody files a new claim on January 1st, they're gonna get 12 weeks worth of benefits, if, you know, assuming they, they stay uh, eligible for those benefits as they're applying. Um, again, only uh, claims open on January 1st. Uh, so that claim stays in effect for a full calendar year. So over the course of a year, 12 weeks of benefits is all that first group is gonna get that uh, uh, availability of benefits is gonna be reevaluated on July 1st. Uh, they're gonna look back at the winter time uh, unemployment rate and base the new weeks of eligibility on that rate. Um, when some things aren't changed, individuals enrolled in making satisfactory progress in a job training or certification program are still gonna be waived from having to look for work and they will be entitled up to an additional five weeks of benefits. That's something new in the program. Uh, as long as they're participating in an approved training program, they'll be eligible for another five weeks on top of that 12 weeks or whatever it is at that time. Okay, what's also changed is the work search requirements. Currently, the uh, unemployment recipients are required to uh, document at least one job search contact per week the new law requires that they document at least five job contacts per week. Uh, three of those five must be variable jo verifiable job applications or interviews, um, meaning they have to keep track of it. Two of those five may be other work related, such as job searches, uh, attending a job fair where they've spoken to multiple employers, uh, job skills seminar, or any related program provided by the Kentucky Career Center or its partners. <clears throat> okay, uh, the work search, as I the work search activities must be very verifiable, as I said, and failure to provide five contacts every week, every week will result 
in uh, disqualification of benefits for that week, just as it does now for the one. If you don't provide that you apply for a job this week, you're not eligible for unemployment for this week. Uh, what is little uh, changed a little bit is they're specifying that uh, the client, the recipients have to keep track of this information and hold on to that information for up to one full calendar year after their claim expires. So when you open a claim, it's open, it, it exists for a full calendar year. So in addition, they need to keep a track to keep a record of where they've applied for jobs up to a full year after that. Uh, it's also uh, changed the definition of suitable work a little bit for this purpose. Uh, employment offered to a worker has received at least six weeks of benefits. Uh, the, the new job that they've been offered has to, uh, has to pay at least 120% of their weekly benefit amount to be considered uh, suitable work. It has to be located within 30 miles of their residence or the job that they're offered can be completed remotely. And the worker is able and qualified to perform that work regardless whether they have the related experience or training. Um, so if a person turns down what's defined here as suitable work, they will lose their benefits. They will be disqualified from unemployment. Um, in the past, that law has always been, if you, if you uh, refuse suitable work, you are denied unemployment benefits. This uh, just identifies a timeline where they have to take basically any job offered to them that meets the other criteria after six weeks. And it does, uh, throw in that additional 120% of their weekly benefit amount. So if their weekly benefit amount was $100 and they turned down a job making more than $120 a week, they'll lose that $100. Okay, um, this hasn't changed, but it was brought up in our, our meeting that we were explaining the new rules and it's in, mentioned in the law, is that we already have a portal for reporting work refusal. Uh, the, the website is listed here, but it is on the employer's, uh, the, the employer's portal for unemployment insurance where they uh, discuss back and forth with the unemployment service. Uh, at that point, you, there's a, it's a form. It's almost like a Google form. Uh, you say, I'm reporting where this person uh, refused a job to offer, and it's uh, forwarded to investigators so they can Take a look at it. They, you know, there are suitable reasons for refusing work. You know, like we said earlier, that job may be more than 30 miles away, or it may be temporary employment. Those are some of the reasons that they can re they can refuse work. Any questions? We have a question online from from Miss Robin. Yes, yeah. I have a question, and and I think you may have answered it. Is a no call no show for an interview um, reportable? as work refusal or does there have to be a job offer extended and not accepted to fit that criteria a, a no call no show for a scheduled interview was failure to report um, they would not necessarily be disqualified permanently from an unemployment claim under the current regulations and uh, it, there's no indication that's changed but they uh, may be temporarily disqualified from at least that week uh, but that is a failure to report even uh, for a referral from our agency to a partner agency for additional assistance in reducing barriers is subject to uh, denial of unemployment benefits. Perfect, thank you. Mike, if I can ask a question, do you feel like this has more teeth to it? It could potentially have more teeth to it. I think it assumes that these are the reasons people are not in the workforce. I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. Okay. Can we get the mic past it? So I love all this, but I'm just wondering, how are you going to track all that? How, how's that going to be managed and you know, timely to reduce those benefits and so forth? Well, that, that's kind of uh, an interesting question. Right now, uh, when a person requests their weekly benefit, they're required to report their work search contact, the one. Uh, going forward, it'll be the five. Uh, the, the new law does specify audits which are already taking place but it also specifies that the results of those audits have to be annually reported to the governor's office and the general assembly uh, so that they can keep track of it as well i the, i'm hoping that some additional staff is dedicated to this auditing process at the state level we will not be doing it locally 
So it's not like automated. If I am applying for my benefits and I only have um, two jobs that I report, it, would I automatically lose my benefits? Your uh, benefits are automatically stopped now. If you are required to do job search and don't report that you have done it. Um, the auditing part as to whether that was an actual job you applied for or you just wrote something down Right. is the part that needs human intervention. That's the that way the process Bible. now is, is if you say, no, I didn't look for a job this week, there's a stop put on your claim until somebody can take a look at it. Of a question. So let's say someone's a single parent and they're drawing unemployment. They apply for a first shift job because that's when they have childcare. And um, Gretchen offers them a job on second shift because she doesn't have anything on first. Um, and that, there is no available childcare in that area for that shift. Um, what does that look like with regard to these new rules and laws? That's where the claims investigator would take a look at suitable employment. You know, what kind of employment did they have to begin with? So they would take that into consideration. That, that would be taken into consideration. Okay. And that's why we don't have the automatic denials. Good. It, okay. it all has to be taken, you know, human intervention is required. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Does the, the, the change in weeks change the, uh, I guess, the people that fit into the category of officially unemployed, or does that decrease the number of what official unemployment is? Right. They don't really take a look at who's getting unemployment benefits to determine that rate. So I get where you're going with that. And uh, my understanding is how they determine at the unemployment rate. Now this rate that we're looking at is the federal determined, the federally determined unemployment rate for the state. Uh, the Department of Labor actually has a staff that they call employers randomly and get their gauges on how many people they've laid off and how many people they intend on hiring. And that's where that comes from, not necessarily from unemployment claims. And I kind of get where that comes from to a point, I mean, there are a lot of people that file unemployment claims that aren't necessarily entitled to file to unemployment. Often, you know, where we get fraud coming in, where they weren't even separated from their job, they'll file an unemployment claim. So it's kind of hard to go off of that data. My screen. Okay, what's also been added for this law is a work share program. Um, we weren't really given a lot of uh, insight on how this is going to operate, but it will be. Uh, provided at the state level, um, what this does is it basically it pays unemployed it pays employers additional funds directly to the employer so they can maybe not lay off their employees or give them part time work. It's it's a nice idea. It sort of resembles, from what I can tell, the the COVID relief funds. You know, they say hey, this worked. Maybe let's try it on a more permanent basis. Uh, but it's an alternative to layoff. Uh, it's developed by the Office of Unemployment Insurance to, uh, under the provisions of the UI Unemployment Insurance Sustainability Act. Uh, it allows the employers to supplement the wages lost as a result of work hours. Basically, we're going to pay you to stay an employee for us for your time off. Uh, the employer may reduce normal work weekly hours in an affected unit by at least 10%. Uh, has to be at least two employees in that section of the company and uh, at least 10% of the employees laid off in that subgroup. Um, what was interesting is the companies that lay off seasonally, uh, an example that we're seeing a lot of right now at this time of year is road construction. It's really hard to lay asphalt in the freezing cold, but they would not be eligible for this because they do lay off every year. This is primarily for companies that are having a downturn that's not seasonally related. And as they implement this a little more and get the word out a little more, the, the Office of Employment Insurance uh, will be explaining to employers a bit more about this. And hopefully we can assist with that as well. Um, one other part that I didn't put on the slides, uh, they, they have changed a little bit the entry level, the amount of funding required for new companies. Um, currently, it is the company is required to have uh, 12 quarters worth of 
funds in their un unemployment insurance reserve, that is being reduced to four quarters. Um, I kind of see that personally as a way of uh, reducing that barrier to startup companies. Uh, one of the concerns that was brought up is that also enables a lower threshold for maybe companies coming out of state and bidding on contracts within state. Um, we'll just kind of have to wait and see how that plays out. Yes, ma'am. Do you mind to just like give me an example of how that work share program would work? So, I mean, I'll like our company, due to the chip shortages and electronics for uh, electronics manufacturing, we have like um, have reduced our order. So maybe we work 32 hours a week instead of 40. So walk through what that program would look like for us. As, as I see it, it would be a similar, uh, your company would be a perfect example. You know, it's not seasonally that you lay off. It is outside factors and it pays the company money to allow you to pay those employees for the time you're laying them off rather than laying them off. Um, that, that I can see that working a couple of them. You know, one, the in, individuals are still getting paid, or maybe a little reduced, but not as much as reduced as they were going to be. And two, you keep those employees, where that's a big deal, you know, where I'm laid off and I got this little tiny unemployment check. A lot of people do go find new jobs and all that money that the company has spent on training that employee and relying on that employee, you got to go through that all, that all again for additional expense. Is that a um, reimbursement to the employer? We pay the employee while they're off and then it's a reimbursement from? That was never really specified. So I'm, that's a good question. And maybe by our next board meeting, I'll have an answer for that. I'm really encouraged by these things. I mean, as an employer, very, I appreciate it. Uh, Mike, I appreciate you uh, coming in and providing this presentation. We have been hearing about these changes that were gonna take effect on January 1st, uh, but we needed to get a little bit closer to it to kind of see what those were gonna be. And Mike, uh, you know, appreciate I, I look, you know, we are, my group is the career development office. We actually are not tasked permanently with doing unemployment activities. Our job as CDO is finding people jobs and helping reduce those barriers so people can take jobs and helping the employers. I'm hoping that this will drive more people to get that assistance for us. Um, right now, what I'm seeing is, unfortunately, our staff still devoting too much time to doing unemployment, which I think should be handled by a different branch altogether. Um, but we'll see how it goes. All right, thank you, Mike. We're going to let's turn it over to Holland for our financial update. Uh, good morning. Uh, so we have here the five months uh, for our fiscal year, as uh, we remind uh, pretty much all in the meeting that our fiscal year starts uh, in July. So this uh, through November results and some of the expenses, what, uh, whatever the information we received uh, at the date of uh, November uh, 30th. So, so to the first column uh, D uh, with the budgeted information that right now, currently we have $2.83 million annualized budget with the various resources are listed uh, there, uh, chiefly from Viova. Uh, and then second column, just year to date budget presentation that for, for the first five months, we're supposed to be at the $1.2 million revenue stream. Uh, and the third column F is just for the actual results uh, what we have is spent or booked uh, through uh, November. The one thing uh, for all of us to know that uh, all the contracts are cost reimbursement contracts. So if we don't spend the money, we cannot recoup. So we are non-for-profit truly where, it, uh, and uh, the different way of non-for-profit because all the workforce development contracts are work, uh, cost reimbursements. So we have to incur the cost to re, uh, recover from the state, uh, from the contracts they have given to us. So it's not the bad thing that we are running behind it. We are also, because we uh, the goal is to recoup the, all the expenses uh, once the contract ends uh, and some of the timings as well. So 1.7 as compared to 1.2, it's kind of favorable in the expense side as well, because uh, we've been a little bit behind uh, and, uh, and spending on it all, I would say on track uh, as well. So that's the revenue part, the expenses. Uh, we have the two uh, divisions on the expenses. One is sub-grantee. You can see that we sub uh, spend or disperse around 
72% of the budget to subgrantee related expenses, and board keeps 28% uh, for their expenses up to this point as well. So from the $2 million overall to the subgrantee uh, year to date, it comes to 859. We have spent 676 and 183 is a favorable, but kind of timings difference as well. And, and you can also see the budget expense uh, for the board expenses on the track as well. It's a total 820 up to this point, uh, 341 year to date, and we spent 331 with the fair of all $10,000 variance. Uh, and since as we go for the year end, we try to recoup, do the accrual accounting and pick up all the expenses. Right now is the running rate and that is still, and as I said, it's a cost reimbursement program. So we are able, to bill and hopefully we'll recoup the fund uh, funds as we stated uh, as they spent as well. Any questions, any concerns uh, at this point? Okay. Do any of our board members have any comments or questions regarding the financial report? If not, do I have a motion to approve? Robin will make that motion. Thank you, Robin. Is there a second? Rebecca has seconded. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you. Move on down to our strategic goals. Time for show and tell. <laughs> yes. Buckle up. All right. Well, it's so good. I, my name is Brian Becker. Um, it's so good to see new faces, returning faces. Um, we've not had, as John said, an in-person meeting in quite some time. So you came to a good meeting to come in person. We do hope you know, we're going to fly through the rest of this, but please stick around, mingle, get to know somebody that you may not know, especially you guys that are board members, but those of us on staff with the board and the career team and career center want to also talk to you. Um, so I will start with the screen that we shared last year, just to kind of show uh, the context here, right, of uh, all that we're up to on a regular basis. So obviously, I mean, literally a day and a half after our last, uh, our December board meeting last year, that tornado came through South Central Kentucky and obviously other parts of Kentucky. What that ended up actualizing for us was funding uh, to go to participants. And you've been hearing us present on this uh, throughout the year. And, and we'll have a highlight of somebody served through that funding as well. Uh, we also have been, and we will continue to tell the story today of a very hard earned pot of money that we got to start um, a heavy equipment sciences program that was gonna be used for uh, simulators so that youth at uh, an area technology center to get on those. And so um, that was hard earned money, as I said, um, and we're very excited about that. So uh, we also have a phenomenal re-entry program as we call it, uh, serving justice involved individuals. Uh, Aaron Pointer and Jana Shell are involved with that program. They uh, give you highlights throughout the year and um, you know we'll talk about that today too, but we had to get money to re-up uh, them. And so one, one other thing that we hope is a theme today, in addition to the achievements, is the momentum and the con continuity to keep these things going, because it takes money to keep these things going. Um, and this is very often way above and beyond the normal we owe a kind of management that the board has to do uh, what we're getting into. But that funding turned into uh, a, a new American navigator position, a workforce navigator position, and the expansion of WIOA services, as I mentioned. Uh, we also picked up a, a Kentucky career navigator, full-time person position at Fort Campbell to do recruitment and hawk the wares of South Central Kentucky to the transitioning military, the hundreds that go through Fort Campbell every month. And uh, we have a new executive uh, director for career team, Matt Bacon. So that was a leadership change that happened this year that um, you know, has been uh, exciting for us because Matt was one of us uh, to sort of see him in that role and uh, to uh, support that has been great. And we also have a new person that we've not introduced to you in person before, but Josh Zazek is our workforce participation lead. And you've been hearing us talk about that position. So all these things happen all in a calendar year. So it's amazing. Um, we also were involved and have given you updates about a workforce participation task force that started to form uh, late last year. And that has resulted in us getting funding for Mike's position there in Fort Campbell um, and to also get Josh's position. And we'll be talking about uh, those as we update you. We also got involved in a Hart County CDL cohort. So this again is something we 
shared an update last in the summer with you about. Um, and so Matt will have an update on a student um, that uh, has been served through that, or um, we'll just give you an update on, on, on how that came together and a rehash. We also, gosh, we will be talking about this a lot here in the next few minutes, but we were busy, very busy with job fairs and we uh, knew that we needed to come together going into 2022 and have something that we branded Talent Tuesdays. And that idea was to hire local and to take job fairs into each of our 10 counties. And we were able to do that mostly. We got nine out of 10, but we started in February. So we, we you know, everything's uh, rock and roll for us to continue to do this into 2023. We also had a ton of job fair on campus career exploration workforce events uh, that happened in the spring. And so that, those are highlighted here as well. And we ended the year with our most successful job fair that we've had of the year, arguably probably since the pandemic. Um, our uh, network, which is New Americans um, and Employers Together job fair uh, that we'll highlight and, and share here in just a moment as well. Um, we did a revamp of our Kentucky uh, Career Center customer service process. We'll be talking about that. We shared that last board meeting with you. And it's, it's sort of in background, but our Kentucky Career Center, uh, you know, recertification process, re re-upping things with partners and agreements, lease agreements, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Mr. Franks worked hard on that. That happened this year as well. So I'm gonna jump right into what John referenced earlier, which is the three major achievements. And John can probably speak to some of these if I don't say it properly, but uh, I, I got a video game graphic here. So we feel like we improve service delivery to customers. So we leveled up there. Um, what that means is obviously what the experience is coming into our career center, what it's on the same sheet of music uh, as it relates to the customers that we're serving uh, improved this year. Second area that we leveled up as we grew into the leadership roles, as uh, John had mentioned, and again, you'll see this reflected in where we want to draw attention to this, but the board was leaned on this year and, and we feel we didn't disappoint. So we want to we want to share that with you. And then as, again, as John said, diversified funding, and he'll have a screen that kind of adds up all these pots and amounts that we got. Um, so we feel like we, we were in first place. Uh, we feel like we got new badges and we leveled up here. But legit, we got a new badge this year. And so John, if you'll mention this one. Yeah, sure. We, uh, the Department of Labor has a uh, higher vets award and we applied for that last February. And then we were notified that we had actually earned it. Um, so what, what the higher vets is, uh, any, any company, any employer can can apply, and it's 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 a it's a fairly simple application. But you have to articulate um, how you serve veterans and and what you do to uh, you know to make them part of your team. And so you, you got to talk to you know hiring, onboarding, uh, you know uh, employee resource groups, those types of. You have to articulate what you're doing. And so um, we applied, not knowing if we'd get it, but we actually got. It. Not only did we get it, we got the highest award. We got the platinum award. So we were we're pretty proud of that. Um, but, you know, rather than it be about us, what I would say, what, what I've tried to articulate is if there's any employer in the room, in the region that's interested in doing this, we'll help you with it. It's a, it's a fairly simple process. The application window usually opens up uh, uh, January, late January runs. I think it's open for about six weeks or so through February, and then it closes and then it gets, this, then it goes into the ether. And then months later, you'll find out whether you got it or not. So. And so we found out, I think in October, late, early October, and then the official announcement comes out right, right around Veterans Day in, uh, in early November. So pretty cool. We're, we're pretty proud of that. So we leveled up. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll jump into our first strategic goal. We'll give you guys an update on this. And again, we'll share some success stories here too. But our first strategic goal has to do with engaging employers. And uh, so this is the assessment screen we've been showing you uh, all year and we kind of package things together here, but where we would categorize where we leveled up through the improved service delivery on this strategic goal was again, those talent Tuesdays and bringing those to every county throughout the year. Uh, posting job opportunities at the career center, that, that has happened, right? Flyers have been there, um, but we had staff that always talked to employers and we weren't always sharing that information with the ground level staff at the career center. So when somebody is coming in for an unemployment insurance claim, uh, they might have only had access to however good the flyers were in the building. Now we've got a spreadsheet. We're highlighting that stuff. We're talking to each other. Um, and so staff are really keying in on that. Uh, the on-campus workforce events, again, uh, who'd have thought the best way to get to students is to go to them on campus and not ask them to show up to some place they've never heard of. Um, and so that's that's been very, very effective. 
And again, we will talk about how this, this network job fair went. Um, as far as a category we would say hit two of these goals was our workforce participation group because we did take the lead. John put just as much effort into these meetings that were happening every three weeks as he would a board meeting, uh, prepping and a lot of stakeholders, elected officials, I mean, uh, college presidents, superintendents. We didn't necessarily ask to start this group, but we got invited into it. And then we were the ones making the slides for every meeting and helping steer the discussion. But it has lended itself to supporting us through new, new positions. Um, so we're excited about that and we continue um, we will, we will sort of recategorize that through Josh's position and, and restructure that to focus on the data. So we typically show you where we think we rolled into this year on the black dot there and how we moved along throughout the year with the arrow. And I told John, we're in the green on all these, but you know, uh, he's, he's very modest on, on the progress that we've made because it's a little arbitrary, right? It's projects, it's serving customers, but big progress has been made here. Particularly, um, so who remembers MTV Total Request Live? Anybody ever put a request in? Laura, did you have, Laura, Leslie, anybody online? All right, this was big in the 90s, right? These were like the top videos and uh, was it Carson Daly, I think hosted, other people did. We kept hearing throughout 2021, job fairs. Now let's rewind a year ago, there was frustration because of COVID and we haven't been able to do as many things. And we had done late 2020 as an organization organized an open air job fair, we called it at the Hot Rod Stadium so that germs could spread through, you know, outside rather than inside and we didn't have as much risk going on. But, you know, it, we grew frustrated. We saw employers grow frustrated with job fairs because they just weren't yielding people. People weren't showing up to them. And so we thought, okay, you know what? We keep getting this. It's not what we think is the best way to reach job seekers. There's lots of other ways, but let's, let's, put, let's put people in a room together. Let's try to play matchmaker that way. And we saw, we saw success um, and, and it's been an uneven amount of success to be clear. It has not been, um, you know, gangbusters every time, you know, the doors are open and we advertise these things, but we were hearing, you know, job fairs, hiring events. This is what employers kept requesting. So we came into this year knowing we needed to organize events around that. Um, so Talent Tuesday, again, was created through that. Um, again, the concept is hire local and this is some of the results that happens. So we offer these once a month in a different county. We've had over 100 job seekers come to the eight events. When's the next one, Jake? 713. Yeah. So yeah, next next Tuesday, we will be in Simpson County. So that'll be our last one of the calendar year. Um, but then we will be planning on how to deliver these again in 2023. So you can see some numbers there about the average attendance that we got, average amount of employers uh, that, that came out. Um, again, something that we knew was very successful and sometimes was better than these other public events was going straight to students on campus. Uh, so we formed a partnership with SkyCTC to come and do job fairs. Again, imagine this, go to the campus where the classes are taught and bring the employers that care about which classes and acad academic degrees the students get. So you can't just have everything at the main campuses because that doesn't catch all these different pockets of students and all these campuses. So uh, the results we saw from those were uh, between high school and college ones, um, nearly 1,600 students attended the, about 14 events. And uh, the average amount of employers, again, was a handful or so. Um, but we had high, high participation at these high school events because it was sort of an end of the year blitz uh, to get them out. And, and tremendous props to Matt for organizing a lot of that because where the Talent Tuesdays has been a team effort, Matt sort of, you know, was constantly taking the lead and, and running those sort of so solo with the employers and career coaches at high schools. Uh, to make those happen, but later good groundwork that we can continue to perpetuate, we think, um, each spring. Um, and so again, total events, if you put all the stuff where we were involved, supporting, planning it, promoting it, there were 37 events with uh, 2,200 attendees. So one of the attendees, oh, let me talk about a takeaway too. We saw an unevenness, as I said, and an inconsistency between turnouts and <clears throat> employer participation and representation. It's amazing to me that when we have an in-person event, people are told to go to a QR code because why did I come in person? Why don't we have a way to you know, connect right here and now? Why don't you as an employer have a way to take some information back and show your boss, here's how many employee you know, applications got filled out today. So it's very inconsistent how employers are engaging with employees, even at job fairs, right? Some people have a great setup, a great table, a great welcoming presence. They stand up, right? Others are, you know, detached and, and it's, it's different, right? So we're trying to give advice to employers on how to do this well, how to be attractive. People came, they're willing to talk to you, they're willing to listen. Um, but, you know, 
it's just like anything else in life. It's inconsistent, uneven, and some do it better than others. And so again, we as a board have picked up sort of the, the best ways and the secret sauce on this. And it's not rocket science, but uh, we want to share that. And then I'm going to let Leslie talk to a specific job seeker that came to one of our events. And we do have a story. So let's I'll let, you, let you tee that up while I get ready for the video here. And I will say a plug real quick to those that are joining remotely. The video, we tested this yesterday. It might show kind of slow and laggy because of the internet. So it's mostly a treat for you in the room. <laughs> All right, where, where's the best place to Just stand? right here. Yep. Okay. All right. Hello, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Leslie Whitty. I'm the VP of Communication and Outreach for the board. Um, I do want to say as an aside, Earlier, when the question was asked about remote work, I'm the primary remote work person. Um, due to life circumstances and ailing parents, um, I have to be at home a lot. Uh, so I appreciate beyond words, the board being willing to let me do that. Uh, so I can still do my job while also being there. Um, that being said, whenever we have a Talent Tuesday event, I, I do my absolute best to attend. Uh, it is so important to capture photos. It is so important to get stories and interact with people. And for those of you that know me, you know I'm a people person. So working remotely is, is hard in that way. So when I get to the Talent Tuesdays, I, I wanna talk to everybody. And Tanya really captured my interest. I spoke to her, greeted, we interacted, and I was very impressed by her. Uh, she was very well-spoken, uh, seemed to be, you know, she seemed to be solid. And um, so I spoke with her, she went through and talked to the different employers and I was, I was a bit frustrated that I didn't see interaction from employers um, because I thought here is a hot property. And this woman moved here from California to take care of an ailing family member. Uh, once she got here, the family member has a bunch of cats that she's allergic to. Hey guys. Sorry, I'm getting it ready. Go ahead. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> so I was like, what? Um, so Tanya uh, was forced to move into a homeless shelter, uh, Bowling Park, where we had the job fair. Had we not gone to Medcalf County for this event, I do not know what Tanya's outcome would have been. Uh, this is innovative. This is going to each county to reach people like Tanya. Um, again, I was so impressed with Tanya. I said, do you mind if, if we do a short video segment? And I took it upon myself to make a video segment and put it on LinkedIn and say, hire this woman. Why, why does this woman not have a job yet? Um, I am thrilled to report that she is now employed with Medcalf County Schools. She now has her own apartment. Shannon Gawkey has played a huge, huge role in Tanya's story. And when Shannon texted me and said, Tanya just got the keys to her apartment, I just lost it. I was so happy. Um, so she is working, you know, she told me she'll, she would do anything uh, as far as a job, um, but she is working at the school. I believe she started in the kitchen. She is currently being trained as a part-time bus driver and she just passed the paraprofessional test that they give. So she is going places. She is going places in Medcap County, and it is because we went there. So uh, this video, please ignore, that is a horrible screenshot of me, uh, ignore that. Um, but this is what I posted on LinkedIn. Again, 
we have to think creatively. Uh, we have to really help job seekers. And this was one of those on the spot, what can I do? So short video on Tanya, and I am thrilled to see where she goes. I, I think she will really be a rock star for Metcalf County Schools. So Leslie has just asked her sort of what she's done, what she's done before. So. Yeah, and I think you'll need to go back. She's a little hard to hear. Worked at um, a funeral home. I worked at um, a hotel. Um, so basically, a lot of customer service based um, right. uh, uh, jobs. Yeah. Um, I even have fun with Uber. You know, <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's because it's always different every day. Right. So um, I'm looking for pretty much anything that is uh, right here in town and in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. um, uh, open for any new challenges. Um, just uh, uh, give me a call. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Oh, okay. Uh, Dron is telling me you guys can't see the video that are remote. Is that can somebody confirm if that's the case or not? And unmute. No, we can't. Yes, see it. No. yeah, we can't see it. Can't see it. Okay, I don't know what my controls are that has messed that up, but um, give me just a moment here. Oh, I know what it is. I stopped screen sharing. Okay. Go back real quick here. Spaced, um, right? Uh, uh, jobs. Yeah. Um, I've even had fun with Uber. You know, <laughs> it's it's, fun. it's it's because it's always different every day. Right. So um, I'm looking for pretty much anything that is uh, right here in town in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, open for any new challenges. Um, just. Uh, uh, give me a call. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I looked over Tanya's resume. Um, lots, uh, you know, strong education base, strong skill set, and uh, looking for anything in the customer service field, or you know, you're open, or open to new, open challenges. to new challenges. Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, you've got a prime candidate right here in Edmonton, Kentucky. So, employers. Meet Tanya, and Tanya. Hopefully, you will be you will be employed very soon. But very very impressive resume. Um, very very nice person to talk to as well. Okay, there we have it. Thank you, Leslie. You are welcome. <clears throat> and thank you guys for being patient on the technical stuff. All right, strategic goal two. This is where we try to focus on aligning educational efforts and training. Uh, again, where we would say we had an increased leadership role was obviously our involvement with that heavy equipment grant and helping to launch that. We were invited into that work group and uh, we, we delivered a resource to the table and a, a really big one, almost $400,000 one. So um, as far as our service delivery, again, these job fairs and the career prep for students, we made strides, served a lot more students this year. The data packet reflects some of these numbers. We have some comparisons to last year. Um, we also uh, did resume workshops and have been doing a lot to help youth and reach them for that. The Hart County CDL program, again, we'll have a highlight on that in a moment here. And Career Edge. So we continue to push Career Edge, and Ms. Shannon continues to be our regional guru on this. We had more than double the amount of people accessing Career Edge this year. Uh, than last year. So that's that's an achievement um, that we want to brag about. So again, we've made strides this year, we believe, as far as where we started the year and where we are now. And then I'll turn it over to John for a little bit more of a recap on the heavy equipment. Yeah, th this is definitely a recap. We, we've highlighted this earlier in the year, but this was really a, a significant win for South Central. Um, so just a quick recap on it is we were invited into a working group uh, that included eight major regional employers. So it was really employer driven, Sky CT. Sky CTC, Western, Warren County Schools, um, uh, the Chamber, other partners. Um, and so the conversation, you know, we kind of, you know, I, we identify there's a definitely a need. This is a growing region and there is a huge shortage of heavy constrictors in this region. So that, you know, the, 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 the numbers back that up, the employers back that up and we need it, um, we need it to sustain uh, uh, all the all the current and upcoming growth that's uh, that's projected, and so as we got around the table, I mean the thing about this collaboration is everybody wanted to contribute something to it, right? So the employers were willing to 
uh, contribute actual pieces of equipment, dump trucks, excavators. They were, they were offering to uh, 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 provide the maintenance for that equipment. Warren County ATC, the Area Technology Center was willing to host it. Sky CTC was willing to pay for the high school instructor. And so everybody was put at uh, the Bowling Green Chamber was offering up 10 acres of land so that when students move from simulation to actual pieces of equipment, they actually had a piece of land that they could go push dirt on and dig. So everybody was contributing early on on paper. Uh, the, the, I, I feel like the, the, the linchpin to make this thing happen was going to be the simulators. So you've got to be able to safely train people on heavy equipment in a simulated environment before you put them on a real piece of equipment, especially if you're trying to stand up a high school program. And so we worked with the, the, the education labor cabinet and we, we applied for a, a, a grant money from the governor's reserve. Uh, that was a pretty arduous back and forth process. We had to really make our case. We made it, we secured $392,000. Uh, Matt, Matt kind of spearheaded this whole thing in terms of research and, uh, and getting helping really get the grant, the grant put together. He actually picked up the simulators from Illinois out of a box truck that we rented. I mean, but we we got those simulators delivered into the Warren County ATC um, late or early early August, right before school started. Sky CTC hired an instructor, and um, and 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 um, we have 24 students in that in that program right now going through that and that'll graduate this uh, this May, uh, having gone through that curriculum. Uh, the goal right now, and, and we're in conversation with Dr. Myers at Sky CTC, we only have one instructor who's really tied up between now and May, but the idea that we're, we're pursuing right now with Sky CTC is um, come this summer, we'll offer uh, a version of it for young adults, you know, recently graduated uh, students or adults. We're, we're going to try to incorporate as many outlying counties and bring them in for this. We're working through what the curriculum is going to look like, how long is it going to be, what's it going to cost. Uh, but the goal is to run a, uh, a young adult version uh, over the, you know, during the summertime. So anyway, it was a big, it was really big win for us. There were a lot of partners involved. There's a lot of collaboration. Again, we, we, uh, the education and labor cabinet, the governor's office, um, we had, we had, uh, we had lobbyists get involved through some of the employers. I mean, it was, but, but we were able to pull it off and we're really proud of this achievement. Matt, do you want to add any uh, color commentary to what I just said? Well, like Don said, it was it was a uh, we had a roadblock at every every uh, stop along the way, um, and a lot of those had uh, you know we had to use finesse, but a lot of them we just had to to power through bulldoze. Yeah, and yeah, that was from step one um, all the way through the final step. You know, we finally got word that it got approved in I believe late February. No, it was later than that. It was it was late it was late in the school year so we didn't get to recruit uh, prior to when students get their schedules uh, so we had to wait around for the second round which was basically the first week of school when when students were changing their schedules to recruit for this uh, we were shooting for 40 uh, but we still ended up with uh, 24 25 and all of those are still enrolled in the course and still participating um, we've got employers going in there to talk to them about the importance of it. Uh, what they can go and do afterwards, where they can go and work. Um, the students have traveled across the state to a, a big construction expo. Uh, so they're getting exposure all across the state as well. Um, and I, you know, I just hope they, they stick with it and we get some, some kids in some high paying positions this time next year. That's, yeah, that's a key takeaway there. Oh. I hope you get... <laughs> What's that say? Oh yeah. Let me, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I wrote this. I should know. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the takeaway <laughs> is that um, you know you're here, you know you're going to hear today tactical examples. You know the, the success stories like Leslie just shared. But the board level, at the strategic level, I consider this a strategic win. This is a regional win. Uh, this is this is a role, to, a good example of a role that a workforce board can play. Get involved in these large discussions. See where you contribute or where you can lead, uh, encourage that collaboration, and, and, and then we can do things like this. So, you know, in terms of that, taking on increased leadership, I mean, this is kind of one of those examples we'll point to and really kind of inspire us on how we're thinking about 
projects we can work on the, this coming year. Matt, let's give it back to you very quickly on this one. Okay. Uh, so Hart County CDL cohort, this was a, uh, a special programming uh, facilitated by Sky CTC, uh, help of the board. Um, Judge Show, Jasmine here. Uh, me and Jasmine made several trips down to Hart County High School to, to bring our services straight to them, go where they're at. Um, we started off with, uh, I don't know, around 10, 10 people interested in the, in the cohort. We went through to see which of them would qualify. Um, out of this, we've got several success stories. Uh, Jasmine may speak to a little bit later, I believe, in, in uh, strategic goal number four. Um, but we had um, students, participants who used VOA services who got their training paid for. We had students who just heard about it on the side and then decided to join on their own afterwards. Uh, one of those students is actually Judge Schultz's son. Um, he is up working at the Blue Oval Battery Park. Um, he was making north of $100 an hour hauling dirt back and forth. Um, he recently bought his own truck and is starting his own company. So less than six months removed from high school, he's gone to making more than $100 an hour and starting his own company out of this cohort. And there's, there's several others, maybe not north of $100 an hour, but they're, they're making $50,000 a year six months removed from high school. Yeah, that, that, the color commentary on it is that we, we planned this for months with, with, with Hart County Schools and, and the leadership up there. But the, old, the idea was we were gonna start a cohort, CISKTC start a cohort within 10 days of graduation. So we weren't gonna let those kids that graduated have very much time off. Like we're, we're getting you into a program. And it brought, it drew in kids from Hart County and Barron County. Mm -hmm. Any, anywhere else? Or was it primarily those two counties? Yes. Those two counties. Yeah. So we want to, it's something we want to do again. Uh, we mm -hmm. want to do, we want to, we want to replicate this, that again this coming year. But it was, uh, again, um, big credit to the team, to the career team for uh, really orchestrating this and getting it off the ground and Sky CTC. They showed a lot of flexibility to deploy a CDL, a four week CDL program uh, from, from Franklin to, to Hart County. John, Dr. Myers, thank you for calling to see you today. Yeah, and we'll we'll continue that. Laura and Anna and I now are going around to high schools. Mainly, we're talking to new Americans about the training programs we have. Um, but come springtime, we will all hit the high schools heavy again and recruit for the summertime uh, for, for programs like that or similar. Um, this one is Hunter Green. He is from uh, Barron County, rural Barron County. Um, he lives out on a farm. And so he, has, he had some ag experience. Um, he was not interested in going to high school anymore. Um, I helped Hunter with his, his resume. Um, it did have, we did have some good points on there with the ag experience and he was enrolled in the ag pathway. Um, this was about the same time when we were uh, trying to pull together the heavy equipment uh, grant for simulators and Hunter expressed interest in heavy equipment operations. Um, I told him about the program, uh, but also told him we had been working with some employers on that program. And he was interested in, 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 in operating heavy equipment. Um, so through the uh, heavy equipment uh, committee, um, I talked to several of the employers, told them about Hunter, told them he was a farm kid that had experience running uh, that type of equipment. They were interested. He ended up getting an interview with Scotty's and Scott and Ritter. Um, in the meantime, we went and talked to his principal and his principal allowed him uh, to forego his final few classes in exchange for going to work full-time and that counting as dual credit. So Hunter got to basically graduate in December, work full-time, um, he's still working full-time. He actually chose Scott and Renner. He got offers at both places. Um, he, got, he chose Scott and Renner, um, started out at $18 an hour as a heavy equipment operator assistant and, and laborer. Um, and today he's up to $20 an hour. 
So even before he actually graduated high school in May, Hunter was making close to $40,000 a year and, and now he is. So go Hunter. And there's, <laughs> there, there are tons of kids like him out there. But out in these rural counties, you get, you get surprised at the, how impressive their uh, CTE programs are and how impressive some of the kids are to come out of those places. Yeah. All right, thank you, Matt. Mm -hmm. We'll jump into Strategic 03. This is typically where we highlight our focus population programming, but this is about increasing workforce participation, which again, I'll remind everybody that bleeds over into all the other strategic goals we have. But uh, where we think we increased this year was with our reentry and justice involved projects. We've been working with uh, the KWIB actually, and we've been working on a model to try to take what Aaron and Jana have developed and what the board here and the Cumberland's Workforce Development Board have done as far as all these different pipelines, working with justice involved individuals and trying to create some kind of a statewide model uh, to do that. Because uh, what we are not doing is, is you know, mental health things. There's a lot of other providers doing that. That's a holistic approach, working with mental health, working with local jails, working when people get out, working with recovery centers and, and having a, a plan of action that keeps everybody on the same, again, sheet of music. What's kind of neat is in this model, and again, we featured it last board meeting, but there's an app that keeps people involved and connected and engaged and they can check in. And that's a lot different than an ankle bracelet. So this, this should be more friendly and welcoming uh, to the audience because a lot of them are very earnestly trying to connect and oftentimes can't. But we also, again, through this workforce participation group, um, it was sort of a side project that happened, uh, but there is a website developed called Bowling Green Works. And some employers, if not all of you guys that represent employers are connected to that and getting applicants from it, but we've been helping inform the practices and the outreach on it. Um, and that contract is getting renewed. Again, it's funded by the city and the county here in Warren County and the city of Bowling Green. But um, again, just like employers showing up at job fairs with just a QR code and nothing else. I mean, just putting a message out about we're hiring, there's, there's a finessing, there's a responsiveness that's involved even when it comes in online and we're trying to help uh, inform employers on that and this ad agency on who they're reaching out to and connecting through that platform. Diversifying our funding again, we launched two positions. What's amazing is John put down, we're going to have somebody focused on new Americans and somebody focused on Fort Campbell in 2022, but we didn't have a, we didn't have a dime in our account to make that happen. <laughs> um, and, and here we are, you know, and it was four months later. I mean, not even a full four, a full three months later and both of those positions were off the ground. So first quarter win right there. Um, and we're gonna share the, the result. And, uh, reaching out through group presentations and individual contact with people there. And then again, engaging students at school. And then there's this, this word Wagner Pizer. Um, that's not a rap group or anything. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a status when people enroll in our Kentucky Career Centers and come through. So we've made tremendous strides. Some of the rules and regulations on that were a little relaxed with COVID, but we've gone gangbusters with it. Um, and so again, we would feel like we've moved the, the arrow pretty far down throughout the year on this. In particular, we wanted to highlight as a program highlight. Oops, let me see, there's a chat. Let me see who's making a comment here. Um, oh, okay, Amy's saying that she has a, a meeting to teach. Um, okay, so she's heading out, I think, but thank you, Amy. Um, so again, we, we launched, um, the, the thing is that there has never been so much more groundwork laid for a position than probably this one, because it, it was conceived years ago. We didn't know we were gonna be, be the entity that got to host it, um, but we, we knew exactly what we wanted it to do. And um, it's been, I mean, Anna San Cristofo will, will talk with me here, so you can come on up, Anna. Um, we have some idea about what we needed to do to help uh, in this area, but I would say that the key takeaways have been that um, we must be active and visible in the communities. Again, just like with, Students, you can't just say the name of a building or an address or say it's down there by Mellow Mushroom or it's over there by such and such place. They, they got to know the people and you, they got to see you outside of, of uh, you know, that building. And so um, we, we also have to help them access services. And as Anna says, show them the way, show and explain the process. Something else that we sort of knew going into this year, but really got highlighted was employers or this is kind of a funky area for employers even because you start talking about some of these audiences that our board is focused on and, you know, there's there's some jitters. Um, there's some heebie-jeebies about some of this stuff with safety. You know, somebody's coming out of jail, you say they can work for me or somebody doesn't know English and, and you know, what's that look like? There are employers figuring this out. And oftentimes those employers were not in our region. 
And I think we've moved the needle and we've collected more uh, evidence that this is happening better. And our job fair was a good example of that because we connected to a lot of employers that are doing this, but we still have to do a lot of handholding even for the employers, not just the job seekers. So the results are gonna speak for themselves because this is not even a full year's worth of information, but Anna, tell them what, what you've been able to do. Oh, okay. Well, uh, good morning. Happy Thursday, buenos dias, bonjour. My name is Anna Ana San Cristofol. I'm the new American Workforce Navigator for South Central Workforce Board. And definitely it was a very great year for us and for new Americans. I have been working in this position for nine months, only nine months. And in this time, we make many different program and project for new American. Our goal was and is to work directly in the different communities that we can find here in Warren County and in Bowling Green. But, and we work inside the communities with the community leader and with the other partner that can support and also support at these communities. And, but it's very important respecting their culture and values because each different new American communities has different cultures and values. And the other hands give them the information, the correct information and tools that allow them to build a future, a new future for them here in United States and join the new society. So now we can say that we are working with all new Americans communities here. We work with Afghan community, Arab, Arabic, Arab, um, Hispanic, Berman, Burmese, Bosnian, and African communities. And not only we work with them, they believe and trust in us now. That is very important after this nine months of working. Not only that, math already told that we created a special program for new American high, high school students, junior and seniors, making a presentation one a month with different topics. And we can say already that we work and we cover all high school, Warren County high school, and this program will continue next year. So we can think that English is the barrier or the most important barrier for New America. Maybe yes, but it's not the only one. Maybe it's the first one, but not the only one. To know how the system works is a very important and is one of the important problem for us. In this way, that's why we, one of the other goal for us was and is to guide at New America, to connect at New America with better opportunities job opportunities, career opportunities, uh, I don't know, is resource opportunities, educational opportunities. And in this case, we created, for example, another kind of program that is Interactive Guy. Interactive Guy connect our participant and new American participant with all the possibilities that they have here. Avoid waiting the time and find the correct information in a one place. We continued with this interactive guide that our participants can find in different languages. They can read in their own language and additionally here in their own language. So we have many projects, many programs, but additionally in this process to connect or to research with another employer, for example, we could establish a good relation with different employers and companies and we could support them, we could help them, for example, by uh, different translation, interpretation, or connect, connect them with this new workforce that is new American workforce. And you can see the result, 700 individual engaged in the over 100 group meeting or group presentation, 350 individual personally assisted, 269 connected to job opportunities and 114 positive employment outcome. And our big project, a great job and a big and great success was NET. What for us, the first new American job and education first. We work a lot not only to plan in this uh, job fair, is to give the information, to teach the different communities, and you can see the result. Two employers were present, 13 organizations support us, 
24 interpreters. We cover a more than 10 different languages and a lot of them volunteer. And the attendees were present in more than 250 participants, new American participants. So we could have this kind of result because we work as a team. We work all together because we have very clear that our goal and our focus was help people. And in this case, help new Americans. Thank you. Yeah, that deserves a round of applause. That's right. Good job. Thank you, Anna. So I'll, I'll just add to that by saying most of the people that attended were not working. Um, our goal was to get people that were not working or that are working jobs out of the region. Because again, as I mentioned, some employers that do this really well are not in our region. They're in Northern Tennessee or other places. And we were like, hey, why are you driving? Why are you not connecting locally? Come see, find out what's going on. So Mitomo was there and I know it was uh, successful for them um, and some of their branches that came and locations. And so uh, now the part has been following up with employers. Who'd you hire? How many, you know, we're like, yeah, come on, tell us, tell us more, tell us more. There's been over, 50, there's at least been 15 people. Um, Country Oven was doing interviews on Monday and we haven't heard from them. I can find that out today when I see them. So anyway, it's good. We had a couple employers that came and said, you know, we didn't actually have any uh, openings, but we still came. Collected 20, 25, you know, or more applications. And we're like, well, we owe those people an explanation. We owe them a reroute. And that's what we're involved in doing now. So, um, all right. So our next highlight is actually of a person also named Anna. <laughs> And Shannon first came across her, and so we'll let Ms. Shannon give an update uh, here and a highlight. Yes, I, I believe that Anna Cecilia probably goes by Cece to her friends. She does. Yes, but um, I'm Shannon Gottke. Uh, when I accepted this position with Career Team, I also accepted the title of uh, Partnership Ambassador, and it took me a long time to warm up to that. And and when I tell people what I do, they kind of raise their eyebrows, but. What I finally found out is it gives me a chance to talk to people about what I do. And what I do is go out to all of our access points in the 10 county uh, areas. And that, um, because of that, I get to meet people like Anna. Um, I met Anna, uh, kind of ironically, in Warren County um, at the Warren County Adult Education. She was there uh, working on her GED, which she had since uh, earned. Uh, she takes ESL classes there and had for some time, but uh, Anna's story is that she came from El Salvador 13 years ago. She was very accomplished there. Uh, she was a teacher, which is her first love. She was also an attorney, and she was an elected representative for her political party. So she had a very uh, active and accomplished life in El Salvador. Uh, because of circumstances there, she was forced to seek political asylum in the United States. Uh, you know, a really traumatic story. But she got here 13 years ago. And uh, since then, she has been forced to do unskilled labor to help support her family. And when I met Anna, uh, she was between jobs. Uh, she had just come from a, a, a job that was very uh, physical uh, that she had to give up because of an injury. But uh, we, we worked on her resume at Adult Ed, uh, and her resume was the one she brought with her from El Salvador. So while it had been probably Google translated into English, there was some work still to be done on that. We worked on her resume. Uh, to make a long story short, she found a job that was good paying, but her passion has always been education. Uh, she was first and foremost a teacher in El Salvador, and her attorney uh, credentials were earned strictly so that she could help the parents of her underprivileged students with their legal issues. So even when she had wore the attorney hat, it was secondary to her uh, passion for teaching. So for the last 13 years, she has been trying to get her um, her credentials translated and verified so that she could get back into teaching and she's had no luck. So uh, we talk, uh, I had a conversation with Josh earlier about your passion. Uh, she's got a passion for teaching and, and kind of a funny aside is that her passion always found her even when she was in different places. She was a custodian at a high school and uh, they, they pretty quickly picked up on the fact that she's a math whiz. So the teachers that had 
uh, ESL students that were having problems with math, they would come to Anna and ask her to assist these students. So she found a way to indulge her passion even as a janitor at the high school. Uh, I called um, Anna, our Anna, and she did a fantastic job of finding a company that could finally get those credentials um, translated and verified. And so uh, we had applied to, to, for several positions with Warren County Public Schools. And um, she, she still had uh, a few glitches, a few hurdles to get, get over. Uh, finally, though, she uh, had gotten her application submitted, but wasn't really getting anywhere. And that's where the New American Job Fair came in. Uh, she, she came to the job fair, and after 13 years of effort, she was finally able, for the first time, to get face-to-face -face with a representative of Warren County Public Schools. So uh, that's Laura came in, and uh, Laura translated for her uh, on that day. She, you know, she has a grasp of English, but she's still more comfortable in her, her native language. Laura stepped in. And she advocated for her. She got her to the person that she needed to speak to. They took her uh, into one of the interview rooms, talked to her face-to-face, -face, set up a preliminary interview. Uh, a couple of weeks later, she had the official interview and she is now an employee of Warren County Public Schools. So that is the culmination of 13 years of effort on her part. She always, she came from El Salvador and she always had the passion, she always had the diligence, but because of the fact that, that we provided the outreach and that Anna was willing to work hard, Laura was willing to advocate, uh, our adult ed uh, played a huge role, the access point played a huge role, uh, but then all, it, it is just a, a beautiful story of collaboration. When collaboration goes well, uh, we, we can come up with results like this. And, you know, this has been uh, thrilling to be part of her journey. A uh, few tears, lots of hugs, and you, you kind of get to know these people, but it's, it is truly a success story. Thank you, Shannon. Ooh. Mr. Dick's gonna give us an update, Jake, uh, business service rep with career team on another job seeker success story. Yes, good morning, everybody. My name is Jake Brown. I am a business service representative for career team and the workforce board. Uh, along with my counterpart, Bianca Wilson, who wasn't able to be here today, um, we're primarily responsible on the BST team to connect with businesses, learn what their openings are, learn what their salary requirements are, and try to connect some job seekers to those openings. So it's been a tough effort, obviously, because we know that every company is hiring. And so um, we're always on, a, on the road. It's a road show every time we meet businesses to make sure that gets done. But as Brian mentioned earlier, one of the things that we do to achieve that goal is through job fairs. So we have lots of different ways businesses connect to us through job Fairs, we host them inside the KCC uh, here in Boulder Green in Glasgow. We also go to companies. So if you're doing a, a job fair at your site, we can come to you. Uh, but then Talent Tuesdays as well, that's really our flagship uh, job fair setting. Um, so Leslie mentioned uh, a success story coming out of our Metcalf County Talent Tuesday. Uh, but I've got another one from our Edmondson County Talent Tuesday that occurred back in June. So uh, initially, uh, Minnie Bullock uh, was um, working with Shannon on her resume. Uh, she was looking to get back into the workforce after several years of working in Barron County as a successful owner of a business. Um, and, and she had been out of the workforce a little, for a little bit, um, wanted to supplement her income or supplement her savings rather with an income. So she showed up to our Edmondson County uh, Talent Tuesday at Shannon's request, uh, came with her resumes that she had helped develop and enhance uh, to talk to businesses. And when she got there, she, she obviously didn't uh, meet some of the businesses that were what she was looking to do. That happens from time to time. Um, but every single time that somebody comes to one of our job fairs, Bianca and I encourage people to talk to us because we want to make sure that somebody leaves with a positive employment outcome, a positive step towards getting employment. So we work with Minnie. We actually worked with her to um, get her pre-screened on site. So we asked her some questions. We learned that she was eligible for WIOA services. Uh, and so we got her connected with a, a career advisor within a couple of days uh, at our Bowling Green office. And um, we determined that because of her skills, she had a lot of accounting skills, she had a lot of clerical skills and those sorts of things from running a business for, for a couple of decades. So we actually placed her at our KCC Center in Glasgow, helping some of our career advisors out there to uh, 
do some clerical work, file some papers and different things like that. And she's been a big help to us. And she's been for the last six months really doing some great work, always a smile on her face, always positive, always reliable. Um, so we were really pleased that she came out. And the positive outcome from that is she's actually in January going to be moving to the Barron County Judge Executive's Office to help them. Um, so we're really pleased with Minnie's work uh, and we're really hopeful for her um, and very pleased uh, that she came out. But I mean, the story from this, from our BST perspective, is that we always want people to come talk to us. I mean, if they're not going to find something at a job fair, that doesn't mean that they're not going to find a positive employment outcome because Bianca and I will work with them to ensure that they find somewhere uh, that's a home for them that fits their skill set. Um, so if you ever have people that you're working with, I mean, we do these every month, um, please encourage them to come uh, and we will help them as best we can. All right, thanks everybody, appreciate it. All right, thank you. Jake, do we, you can put it down one of those tables there. All right, let's jump into strategic goal number four. We're on the back end here, everybody. All right, we kind of loosen up the seat belt. We'll be getting up in a minute. You can uh, go to the bathroom and get more food, but we're coming to the close of the meeting. Um, number four is our, our you know, viability of our financial growth, quality, uh, delivery system and, and uh, the RLI for the public. Um, again, we've already mentioned this several times, but getting that diversified funding, John will speak to that with amounts here in just a moment, improving the service delivery. We've had social media growth. Those numbers are reflected again in the data sheet on the last page there. Um, we did have a glitch where we think we were hacked or something weird happened with our Kentucky Career Center Facebook social media account there on Facebook, but we rebounded and, and we're back on a full steam there, but we have increased viewership, followership, uh, whatever you call that stuff on social media, right? Hopefully you guys are all connected to it. If not, please do it. Um, we, we appreciate the comments on LinkedIn. We appreciate any of that kind of feedback. Tell us what you want to see more of. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we continue to do, uh, again, back, background uh, stuff like revising our MOU and infrastructure agreements. That's a lot of work that goes into doing those things. So we don't want to uh, just, you know, say that too quickly, but uh, that's an achievement as far as how we continue to be better. And then uh, again, we feel like we move the needle forward in this area this year. So uh, Frank will come up and, and or he'll have a mic and maybe share a few words here too. But we shared this again at the last month's meeting. A lot of people have come to the career centers over the years for a lot of different reasons. And it was very easy for them to come and see a staff member and just go right out. Um, we are the workforce board and we, we act like we're the bosses of everything, right? Or we might give you that impression. We're not. Uh, we work with a lot of other state entities and, and sub-grantees and things, um, and we're trying to align things um, and, and do things that make good sense. But the Kentucky Career Center, the Unemployment Insurance Office, I mean, we wanted to revise processes last year and coming out of the pandemic and when things open back up. And as Mike has already said, UI just clogs all those efforts up. The demands on his team's time to clean up UI was making it very hard for us to say, but are we telling about 20 different jobs that are available right now? Um, we're there now though, right? And we, we just wanna to continue to say that. One of the things with how we achieved this was um, career team had done a lot with uh, customers on staying on the same page through Google. And so we kind of took a practice that they had had. Aaron and Jana had done this with uh, re-entry and, and working with participants at court settings, try to take these best practices and make a single document in a single form that customers could actually put in and it all feed in together. So we, we've done some of that through Google, keeping everybody on the same page. Now there's just a single way that people are coming in, getting a flow through the building, connecting to an actual staff member. Um, and so Frank, if you'll talk a little bit about what happens when they, when they meet with somebody. Good morning, my name's Frank Garibata. I'm the one-stop operator at the Career Center Centers. Um, <laughs> Let me clarify something, a one-stop operator, um, in case you didn't already know it. Way back in 2005, when I was selected to be the manager of the then called OET, the Office of Employment Training, the manager of that building, there was no one-stop operator. We were the only agency in the building, uh, OET, TG remembers. Uh, since then, we've, we, we have evolved the several agencies in the building. We have career team, we have the Office of uh, Vocational Rehab, we have uh, representatives from Job Corps, representatives from uh, uh, Sky CPC with Adult Ed. So there are several partner agencies in the building. The one-stop operator, my job as the one-stop operator is to make sure you know, everything flows really nicely, okay? When I first came on board, 
I advocated to all the different staff agencies there. You don't work for me. I don't work for you. What we have in common here is the customers who come through our building, who come through our. And so my, my, what I advocate to all our partner agencies is if you provide excellent customer service, excellent customer service, guarantee they're going to come back or word of mouth is going to come out and say, they provided good service to me. I got a job to be done. They handled my unemployment insurance claim. I want to go back to see that person. And that happens. I, I can't tell you how many times it, it just warms my soul when I hear people say, have a blessed day. You did so much to help me. I see people from career team come and they hug their career advisors. You did so much to help me. You did so much to help me. That, that, that just warms my soul. Uh, so as a one-stop operator, yeah, I like to make sure that, if, that we take care of all of our customers. And I see that every day. And because we do that, one of, again, uh, taking care of customers and staff there, it makes my job easy when we do that. When people come into our career center, I can see everybody, or I know everybody who comes into that center because of this, this spreadsheet that we develop. I know why they're here, who they're going to see, and we, we can follow up with everybody that comes in. We know who's going to see them, whether it's career team, whether it's career development, career development office, uh, an appointment with an OBR representative. We know why they're here, and we can actually follow up for every customer that walks into that building. And we average between seven and 800 people in both centers per month, which is significant. So anyway, uh, it makes my job easy as a one-stop operator when we actually take care of all of our customers. And I tell John, every time he comes to visit me with this month a week, we are a well-oiled machine. We are a well-oiled machine. We take care of our customers and, 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 I'm, and I'm really happy that we do that. It makes my job easy uh, that we take care of customers so I can do my other jobs like answer the question. There's a spider in my cubicle. <laughs> Turn off the air conditioner. Turn on the heat. I, I do that also. So, uh, and I will say because TJ is here and I didn't get a chance to, to mention before, we are uh, required uh, to be certified, okay, as a one-stop center. And thanks to TJ and her team, TJ is not shot a board member, and her team, I, we talk about this in my meetings with other OSOs nationwide in Washington, North Carolina, Texas, Florida. Certification process, for us, it is a big deal. Okay, it is a big deal. Each state does it differently. In our state, we have somebody from our board, someone from another board, community partners, business leaders, they come in and actually they check us out. Okay, there's a long list of, of, of uh, checklist. And I'm proud to say we are certified and it is a big deal for us, thanks to TJ and our team. It is a big deal for us because that verifies nationwide. We are doing what we are supposed to be doing in accordance with state, federal, and state, federal, and local guidelines. All right, and so what we would say, thank you, Frank, and we called an audible because Bernetta couldn't join us here today. She's the CDO center manager, but John's got a point here on the key takeaway. I mean, we have, Bernetta came in as the November, in November last year as the region, uh, not the regional, Mike is the regional, as the local manager. Matt came in into his role and we were already working with his predecessor on a lot of this, but a lot of this is connecting the streams and flowing in the same direction. There's gotta be a willingness because uh, we, we say this internally kind of often. We're not waiting for an external factor to influence us to get together uh, and do this. We really want to dream together what this can be like. We've actually made a thing, and I don't know if we shared this at the last board meeting or not, but if somebody from UI comes in and they're like, I don't want to talk to anybody about a job, we make them sign something. So we make it seem like Frankfurt's getting those cards that they have to sign. They're not, but that's the impression we want to give them is somebody's going to know, oh, you're turning down this, but hey, we got new ammo now. Maybe that's going to feed right in with this, you turn down a job opportunity or uh, a, an event that we promoted or something. So anyway, um, 
tremendously improved our customer service because we've had leaders willing to work together and get on the same uh, sheet of music on that. So John, tell us again what these yeah, I know. funding amounts have been here. Just the last, uh, before that, just yeah, on the leadership piece, I mean, when you have multiple agencies in a, in, a, in a building to get everybody to like play nice, work together, row, row at the same time, that's what we've got right now here in South Central. And I'm very proud of that. And it's really a credit to Frank and to Matt and to Vernetta and to Mike and to everybody that works in that career center um, that, that we've gotten to this point because it didn't happen, it, not on purpose, but through COVID, we, we got into some poor practices in that building and got in, in, in where we weren't as cohesive, we weren't, we weren't as efficient, we weren't as customer service uh, uh, proficient as we should have been. And kind of Brian, I charged Brian, hey, that's your first special project, get that thing revamped. And that involved moving people, which if you've ever tried to move somebody out of a cubicle or an office, that could be a significant emotional event, but everybody did it. Everybody picked up, everybody just completely relocated so that we can make people th move through that building the way we wanted them to move through it. And we can make them have an employment conversation. You're not leaving that building without an employment conversation, unless you already have a job and then we'll let you, yeah. then we'll, we'll let you leave without that. But if you come in there without a job, you're having an employment conversation or writing or putting or signing something that says, I refuse to have the conversation. All right, so anyway, credit one, to you guys. Let me say one thing real quick, and I hope the, the ones joining us virtually, you, you've seen the data sheet. I know Deronda had resent the invite uh, with the, the attachments, so it should be in those attachments now. But if you look at the 7,000 people we were able to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with about job opportunities, see how many of those are UI, <laughs> over 4,000. That's how many people we really didn't have to have, we didn't have a lot of influence over in the past because it was just sort of a business transaction getting them in and out. So it's a big portion when we didn't get to have jurisdiction and have influence in that and, and that population. So we're, we're very happy with how that's come along. Okay, sorry, go ahead. All right, so quickly diversification of funding. Uh, we, we've been, we've had a, it wasn't until I put this together that, you know, it's like, wow, we've, been, we've had a really, really good year. Um, some of it due to, uh, 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 you know, some of it due to things beyond our control, but you know, the, the, as we mentioned, the, um, here in about here in about 36 hours will be the one year anniversary of the tornado that ripped through Western Kentucky and South Central. Uh, as as horrendous as that was, um, it did result in us getting an actually a, a one million dollar grant to be used over a two year period. So, um, so we we've had an influx of of disaster funding, which has really helped us serve a lot of customers. Um, we've talked about the heavy equipment simulators, you know, again, we didn't, we just, we did the work to get this, uh, uh, uh get this grant and, and pay for these simulators. We were fortunate to, um, to, uh, be able to get, uh, some statewide reserve funding for our reentry efforts. Um, 112 of that's coming from the state, 14.5 of it's coming from the Cumberlands, um, that, um, who we share those staff with, um, that's a typo on Fort Campbell. Um, that's a, it wasn't 590,000. Um, for Fort Campbell, uh, we ended up getting uh, $72,000 for 36 from the city of Bowling Green, 36 from Warren County. They wanted those, they wanted those positions. Uh, so they funded it. They've given us that money. That money's coming in in increments, uh, but that's funded through next May. Um, and we're, you know, right after the new year, we'll be working on another round of funding for that position. Um, and then um, 80, uh, roughly 80,000 came in for uh, Joshua's position. What's unique about that is Joshua is actually technically a WKU employee with some money, you know, WKU has funded, uh, got a grant for most of his position. But the, through the workforce working group, I mean, they're the funders, but, but he works for us. That's the arrangement. And that just speaks a little bit to kind of the leadership role and the trust that we've engendered this year uh, to, to, to take on workforce participation as a, as, a, as, a, as a project. And then through our other two nonprofits, Employee Word and uh, uh, My Workforce Future, we've also really generated a lot more income and coming through there. Not that's, that's revenue, not profit, but there's, a, there's, there's money flowing through uh, those two uh, nonprofits uh, significantly more than in uh, the year prior. So we're proud of that. We've got to, you know, I, I, I oversee both of those. And so I'm really, as I've been kind of communicating with the executive committee, um, I got to continue to grow that and grow that and grow that because we owe a funding is, 
even if we owe a funding stayed steady, it's not the purchasing power that money is going down, right? I mean, it's just, it's not keeping pace with inflation. So to stabilize our, our staff and our operations, we've got to have this other revenue coming in and we have to have other investment to, to sustain the level of service that we're delivering. Um, let's go next, depending on any questions and we'll do a quick story here. Yeah, so one of these uh, highlights we wanted to show was from the tornado efforts, that special funding that extended some of the services that we can provide. And we've got Jasmine at the Career Advisor. She's maybe shared before at the board meeting uh, in the past, but uh, welcome Jasmine and tell us about Scott. Um, so Scott definitely um, used the grant for what it really was for. He was um, dislocated for, from his home um, due to the tornado. Um, he was having to live at the KOA campgrounds for a while, um, was able to complete the training program at Sky CTC um, with no issues. He um, went in, completed in four weeks, tests right afterwards, um, was able to obtain employment with UPS, which is really good because you don't really hear of um, like UPS or anywhere like that hiring someone with no experience right on. Um, so he completed the training. He started with them as a seasonal employee and um, was offered a job full time, but he would have to relocate. So he actually relocated to Jefferson County. Um, he's making about $52 an hour and um, is very great. Like he's grateful for the program. He told me he was like, guess how much I'm paying for my insurance for myself and my daughter. And I was like, mm, maybe. $75 a month. I'm just guessing. He was like, nope, it's free. I want to thank you all. He was like, I've never had this opportunity to be able to work and not have to worry about, you know, benefits for my family. And like, I'm actually working with him now on um, helping someone else get on with EPS as well. So. Excellent. All right. Good job, Jasmine. Thank you. All right. And we'll close out as we normally do with a workforce participation update from John. All right, we're going to be quick. Uh, okay, so again, we've, we've been focused on workforce participation all year long. I mean, I've been reporting on that. This really started off as a working group that was meeting periodically. And out of that working group came the funding for the Fort Campbell position, what came the funding for Josh's position, um, uh, the, the funding for the ad agency to, um, to, do, um, to promote South Central Kentucky and try to recruit talent into the region. Um, so it's been ongoing, but out of that, out of that discussion, you know, what, what, what came out of it is like, listen, we got to move this from a part-time once every three weeks conversation among, among a, a working group to a full-time focus. And so that led to Buddy Steen at the WKU Innovation Campus going in out and getting a $50,000 um, economic development grant. So he got the first 50 and then uh, the city and the county said, we'll throw in 20 each there's some, you know, so that's 90, but there's about 80 available uh, after they, I, I don't understand all, but there's money peeled off of it. But anyway, jo Josh is, we got, we got Josh hired. We got Josh hired here uh, a little over a month ago. Uh, I think it was a month today. Oh, it was a month today. Oh, all right. One, one month anniversary. So <laughs> this was, you know, from, we, we conceived of the full-time position last, late last spring, but you know, got him, got him hired and uh, you know, got him going. So um, again, he's really technically a WKU employee working for us, works out of the innovation campus, <clears throat> which if you haven't been there, it's, uh, they've got some really cool things going on. Um, let's go for one. Okay, so let me, let me just, so let me set, let me set this up real quick. So as we studied workforce participation, kind of waiting on to come on board. One of the things we've looked at is what are the participation rates? What are the participation rates across our region? And in Warren County, it turns out the labor for the workforce participation rate is actually well above the national average, which means we're not going to move the needle a whole lot in Warren County. But if you look at the surrounding nine counties, the labor force participation rate is well below the national average. Uh, it just depends on the county. And so we thought, well, one of the things we've got to we got to work on these we got to work on these other counties, right? I mean, let's let's what can we do to help these other counties tackle this? And so 
we're taking a three-step process of this. The first step is where I go in and I do the annual update to the, to the judge executives. I've already been to see Judge Cannon and said, here's what we've done. Here's what we've done last year for you in terms of WIOA and, the, and kind of, you know, some of the things that we've shown today. Part two is we want to come back and we want to hit your employers and we want to give your employers, you know, in an hour and a half to two hour setting, we want to just give you some basic things going on, the data in your county and some, some strategies that you can use to better recruit pockets in your county that aren't working. And part three is, is going back and tackling more of the difficult aspects of workforce participation, which is cultural attitudinal factors that are gonna be you know, intermediate and long-term things that we've gotta tackle. So that said, our, we're, our first county we're headed to next week is Butler County. And I just wanna give you a tasty morsel of what this data is going to look like. And it's much more expansive than what I'm going to show you today. But if you could go forward. So in terms of Butler County, they've got a working age population a little over 10,000. Go forward. Uh, their labor force participation rate is 53.9%, which you can see is uh, um, almost 10 points below the national average. That's, that's, that's significant. What that equates to in Butler County is you got almost 4,700 people not in the workforce. Okay, 40, now people aren't working. There's a variety, of, it, it's a broad spectrum. There are caregivers, mothers, fathers, people taking care of their, their parents. There's the legitimate reasons why they're not in. And then they're on the other end of the spectrum, there's able-bodied people that could be working that aren't. So that's what comprises that 4,700. So what we're, what the conversation that we're enabling in these counties we wanna have is, hey, what can we do to move your counties Workforce participation rate to the national average. If we, so in Butler County, we need to we need to convince 957 people to get back into the workforce. That would bring Butler County up to the national average. Um, we're, so you know we, we we're pulling Josh, Josh is pulling this data from multiple sources, but we're primarily leaning into American Community Survey data. So so when we right now for Butler County, we're looking at. It's, we're mostly breaking Butler County out by age ranges. And we're looking not only at ages, ages, but levels of education, whether you have you know, children below six years old, children above six years old, children with both. So we're breaking it out in different, and we're identifying the pockets, like which, which of these different demographic groups are, is there a significant number of people not working? And so one of the, one of the, uh, categories identified is the largest pocket, 55 to 74, not working. That makes up 2,088 people not in the workforce in Butler County. So what, okay, so what, what can we do about that? What can employer, how can employers tackle that? That's just one demographic. How can they tackle it? So what do we, what do we know about 55 to 74? I'm going to go to my notes real quick so I don't miss anything. Again, this is this is a this is what we'll be talking about next week with them. So, so what do we know about this group? Well, they're baby boomers, right? So they have they they have the they have the the generational values of, of baby boomers. Um, they take pride in their work. They're probably retired already at least once, right? So, um, um, given their age, there may be some physical limitations to the type of work they could do, but they value being in the workplace. They value workplace visibility. They're, they're, this is not necessarily your optimum group to, to offer remote work opportunities to. They're going to value being on site in front of people at, at the place of work. Um, they value face time. Uh, they're generally self-sufficient. Uh, they're going to be competitive in nature. They're going to be loyal. Um, it may or may not be digitally proficient. I think that's going to be a little bit, you know, that's going to be hit or miss. What does that mean in terms of um, so let's, let's, let's examine what that means in terms of operationally and then recruiting wise. So operationally, you know, this, this audience might be uh, a great audience for part-time opportunities with part-time on-site. It's also a great audience for flexible hours, right? And they, they may not want to work full-time or, or may not be able to work full-time. They may be doing a lot of volunteer work or spending time with their grandkids, but may need, but may be interested in working, you know, some amount each week. Um, operationally, if, if there's a way that you can attach an identity to a role, that's that would be important for this age group. And then, in terms of uh, um, 
something to consider. And, and again, Brian has alluded to this because we've, we've been to a lot of, we've hosted a lot of job fairs and we've seen a lot of different techniques that employers use. But this generation is gonna be more apt to a, a traditional application rather than a QR code or a digital application or being told, go to, go to Indeed, right? So um, recruiting, op, recruiting tactics to consider, uh, appeal to their experience because this generation values experience. Um, ask for their expertise. You could, you, 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 could, you could ask for that expertise in the recruiting ad in the way that you advertise that position. Um, again, consider traditional advertising methods. You might have to look at mail or print or, or traditional media. Um, you know, th th this generation's probably not hanging out on LinkedIn. They might not be able to spell LinkedIn, right? So, and again, we see we see a lot of companies that are pretty set in how they wanna do their practice because they, they, they set their recruiting practice around what's the easiest, most efficient for them as an employer. But in today's marketplace, employers employer you're not hiring you're not hiring the, the employee the employee is hiring you that's the that's the change in in in, in the workplace right now the employee is hiring for you so you got to figure out how to adjust your recruiting your marketing efforts and and how they apply to fit the customer that you're recruiting for so what and advertise as a way advertise the job as a way perhaps to for that person to uh uh to stay active, to stay fit, to stay engaged, right? Because um, a lot of times uh, this generation, um, they'll retire, they'll be at home a month and then they get bored, right? Or, or the significant other kicks them out, like you're driving me crazy. So they need something to do. They need a social outlet or they need, they need that. So like, like leverage that, leverage, the, leverage that in the way that you advertise and speak to them. So that's just one pocket that we're going to talk to Butler County employers about. There's other pockets, but we're going to we're going to get into that level of detail and uh, and and try to show them some strategies that they can use to ex exploit the different pockets that they've got. Another big pocket in Butler County is um, uh, folks with a, at least one child under six and another child over six. Um, it's a big pocket. Well, you know, so if you kind of take this same methodology. You're, it's a younger, it's a younger cohort. It's probably more geared towards the, the the need is probably more towards flexible hours for remote work. And so, you know, if that's your target demographic as an employer, then let's, you know, we just want to share those kind of strategies with you. So, it's not guaranteed to get 957 Butler County residents back into the workforce, but it, but if you do it right, maybe we can put a dent in it, right? I mean, that's that's the whole goal. Oh, I went way long. That was nothing, nothing short about that. Okay. That concludes everything today. Um, I know we're over, so if you got to leave, leave. But if you want to comment, discuss, complain, have at it. Now's the time to do it. And I'll just add employers that, and HR folks that just heard this. If you guys want to respond to us, we're going to be presenting this to Butler County next week in our first format of this, but we'll go with county to county. We'd love your feedback. Like, what, what, what made you lean in? What would you want to know more about? Because you're our target audience to get this information into. So, any questions? Yep. Um, I have a question about, you know, the 957 that your target, and then the good portion of them is that um, uh, 55 to 74. And so when, when you go and take this to Butler, you know, your target's 957, but if you break it up into those uh, areas, can you give them an idea of how likely it is to, you know, put a number on potentials in the 55 to 74? Uh, because really you'd see exactly what you say. Most of them retired, maybe they're, you know, can't work, whatever the case may be. That's sort of a, um, a big group and so there's a number in there that can't do something so what's the most likely number that you could get reinterested into entering into the workforce if i if i was sitting there from butler county i might want to know you know that realistic number for those particular age groups however it is you're breaking them up 
Yeah, I, I think we can take a stab at that. Uh, I, th I see, I see uh, Josh kind of, you know, doing the thinking man pose. So we'll, we'll take a stab at that. It is a little hard to kind of discern, you know, out of the 4,700 not working. It, there's, there's not very reliable information on how many, how much of that 4,700 is legitimately, you know, can't because of something versus how much could. But I guess I might look at um, what the numbers are today of 55 to 74 that are in the workforce and extrapolate from that and apply it to the group that you have from 55 to 74. Okay. I don't know if that makes sense, Joshua, but that's the direction I'd try to head. Yeah, I got kind of the disability rights too. Yes, we're... Absolutely. That's a, that's a, that, that's on our big data. Sheet, Here, Josh, so. you want to say something? You want to take this? Yeah. yeah. So I think a good way to kind of um, start narrowing that down, I think getting an exact number um, would be pretty difficult, but to narrow that down a lot, start adding in kind of the other pockets that we're going to be presenting, like uh, you just mentioned disability. Um, there's about, I think, 1,200 people uh, with a disability in Butler County, uh, but there is a large proportion of them that are not drawing disability. Um, so knowing that might be here are these people who might be disabled, but might still be open to work because they're not actively on disability. And then that's around 500 people, I think, if I'm remembering my data correctly. So once you start compiling all of that together and you say, okay, I'm appealing to 500 disabled people who probably need money from some source and they're in this age range and they're doing this, then you're gonna just start narrowing it down through uh, knowing who you're kind of talking to, if that makes sense and answers your question a little bit. It does, and, and I guess I was looking at it, at, uh, I was looking at, it a, at a broader context where there's some statistics about how many baby boomers, to use that phrase, are in the workforce today. Mm -hmm. And so if you know that you have a thousand people that are baby boomers, then what's that number? Is it 20% of the baby boomers are in working today of all the possible baby boomers that we have because there's numbers out there that will that will tell you that. So then the likelihood is that you may be able to gather 20% of those folks. It's not an exact number, but I would go in with some of that likelihood in each category because the first thing you see when you go 55 to 74 is like, do those people, if they're not working, do they really want to get back into work? Well, they do for a variety of reasons because they're doing that today. Does that make sense? That's not a specific, and after you get Butler into the Groove County, then you can start drilling further down. I'm just saying take a larger number that you can get to easier. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense actually. I think that's good data to gather. I'll probably try to get that further forward, but it's kind of, yeah. Yeah, so I think kind of going off of that and getting like the averages and the stats of kind of the baby boomer generation and how many retire and then re-enter the workforce, that would be very helpful. So yeah, I'm definitely going to look into that yeah, then. There were a lot yeah. more before COVID. Yeah. And COVID allowed those 55, 74 to go out. Just exit, exactly. Mm -hmm. You'll get to a number, I think, that at least will encourage the county to go, hey, there are 55. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and so we like you said, we heard this information news reported that people had a mass exit from the workforce, particularly that age group. Well, how many live in each of our counties? Now, now we're going to be able to get that in front of people. Yep. Anybody else? Um, I do not have a question. <laughs> I do have uh, I do have not one, but three challenges to leave everyone in this room with. Number one. If you are on any social media channel, personally, I am asking you to please follow the board. We are very active on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and our numbers are growing. We need you. So if you are involved, if you cared enough to come to this meeting today, please like us on social media. 
we have limited funding to do boosted ads on Facebook for events. Very limited funding. Therefore, we rely heavily on others sharing our posts. Liking is nice, but it doesn't really do anything for us if you like a post. Um, this Butler County event coming up, we need shares of that. You have connections with Butler County. Um, even if you don't plan on coming to the event, because it's specifically for Butler County employers, click that you're interested on Facebook. That kind of stuff builds momentum. I'm a huge uh, Joe Emmel follower on Twitter, and you constantly see where people share that a dog has been lost. And I'm all for that. I love dogs. I love pets. I love animals. I'm asking you to share things that change people's lives. So it's very easy to do. The third ask is once the meeting concludes, anyone who is up for it, um, I have a box of Slim Jims and I want to get a group posted holding Slim Jims because Slim Jim Corporate is now following the South Central Workforce Development Board on Twitter. And if we can go viral because of Slim Jims, you know what? I'm trying, I'm trying everything I can, you know, to get us free publicity. So if you're willing, um, I would ask that of you. And um, please, Please hear that this is passion um, because I, I love what I'm doing. I believe in what we're doing. And this is a very easy way for you personally to help us in doing what we're doing. <laughs> all right, that brings us to the end. Ms. Trevor, back to you. Okay, thank you all so much for being here today. Our next meeting is on February 9th and hope to see you guys. Hope I can be there in person as well. Um, since if there's no further business, uh, today's meeting is now adjourned. Everyone have a great day. Thank you.